So, nice to see you all. I'm Mike. Uh, currently, I'm a Master of Science in Biology student at the LMU. And right now, I'd like to share with you some insights into epigenetics. But before we're diving straight into epigenetics, let's talk about genetics. And so, I wonder if you ask yourself a question. What is the difference between, uh, what makes the difference between people, right? Scientifically, it was calculated and proven that actually uh, the variability among human DNA is less than 1%. Nevertheless, we are so different. So here is the answer. DNA makes us different, makes us different people, and it's not equal, apparently, and makes different organisms. <laughs> so in that case, it's obvious, right? But how does it work? How our genes work? And so here is the answer. We have DNA sequence. And if we take a closer look into it, avoiding the chemistry, we get something like this. These are letters that make up the words out of which functional products are built, like proteins or different ribosomes, enzymes. And all of them combined make us the way we are. And this particular example is actual sequence taken from biotechnological database. Uh, it's a fragment, of course, it's not the full sequence. And with the help of transcription factors, special protein machinery that reads it and produces functional product. In that case, it's insulin. This is the real sequence. So these are not region bases, and they act as the words. But is it that simple? What about different tissues? different uh, cells in our body, right? It was estimated that in average, on average in human body there are 37.2 trillion cells. And many of them are so different, but all of them were derived from one fertilized egg, which is also known as zygote. And zygote divides, divides many times, and in the end we get this. So in every cell of our body, the DNA sequence is the same. So how is it possible to make it uh, different, yeah, different flavors out of one set of ingredients? Well, epigenetics is the answer. What is about the genes, right? <laughs> and so it's all about modifications. So we have this raw DNA, one strand. Uh, it's not one strand, but let's imagine for simplification that one strand, which is the same in all of our cells, and it's a master code, yeah? But it can be modified. So something else can be added above this strand, which doesn't change the strand itself. And afterwards, for instance, this part is red, and we get blood cells. Or like this part is red, and this is avoided, and we get nerve cells. And that what brings us all these cell types, metabolo uh, metabolic differences. That's why muscle cells are muscle cells and liver cell is a liver cell. But let's mm, take into account how it actually works, right? What are epigenetic mechanisms? So the first major mechanism is DNA methylation. So it's actually a bit complex. If look at it under uh, from scientific point of view yeah there's like one particular nitrogen base that can be modified but if we take it like this unmethylated DNA we get the product methylated DNA it can be read so transcription factors machinery proteins that are responsible for reading this part they cannot access it right they bumps off this strand and also DNA is packaged so it turns out that actual length of human genome is two meters. And you remember, 37.2 trillion cells. How is it possible to package all of it, right, compactly? Well, this is how it's possible. There are special proteins called histones. And if we take a closer look, we'll see something like this. So DNA is wound around these protein spindles. These protein spindles are highly complex. And these proteins, histones, have tails. And these tails can be modified as well. And so if they are not 
uh, acetylated. De so it is called deacetylated histones. We get packaged, uh, we get DNA packaged really tightly, and it looks like this under electron microscope. If they are in contrast acetylated, we get DNA that looks like this. So common sense allows us to guess that it's much more likely that protein machinery can access this particular part than this particular part, right? So just simply to remember, acetylation means active gene expression or healthy gene expression where it's needed, right? And deacetylation means gene silencing. Also, it is, you may um, keep in mind that deacetylation is often associated with subsequent methylation, so histones can be also methylated. But we're not going into details. Here is the schematic re representation. So basically, acyl groups allow histone tails to spread this, uh, these protein spindles from each other. And if you'd like to have some particular example, let's take this embryonic stem cell that gives rise to all cells in our body. It is capable of doing so because the gene uh, genes are crisp, they're free of any modifications. But if we methylate this part, it won't be expressed. If we acetylate these two genes, like, sorry, this is X5. Just think that this is X5, okay? <laughs> uh, we get actively expressed genes. And so, for instance, let's say that this is pancreatic cell or beta cell of Langerhans Islands. And here is the brain cell. And you can take a look, take a closer look, and see that there is one particular thing about it. So one gene is methylated in every cell. And one gene is acetylated and actively expressed in all cells, in both of them. So this is how it works. Some genes are necessary to, to be kept silent all the time. The others has to have to be expressed, that is, um, used in all the cells, most of the time, or all of the time. And these are just tissue-specific cells that are specific for neuron and specific for pancreas. But how does it apply in our everyday life, right? What use we can make out of it? Well, here it is, cancer. It turns out that cancer can be caused equally by epigenetic modifications without changes in the strand, right? Without any mutations, genetic mutations, as, yeah, as actual change. And again, example. So there are special genes that called cancer suppressor genes. And if something goes wrong with the machinery that is responsible for maintaining uh, epigenetic uh, landscape, uh, we get this gene methylated, it cannot be expressed anymore. And as its name says, it has to suppress cancer. So if it cannot fulfill its functions, what we can get? We can get cancer. Or there are so-called oncogenes, and if they are demethylated, we can get cancer as well. I'll tell you what is the difference between oncogenes and cancer suppressor genes, and what their actual function in the body in just a moment. So, you may ask yourself another question after what I just said. So, epigenetics can change, right? It can cause cancer. How is it possible? So, well, this is one of the proofs that it actually works. One sleepless night can um, stimulate changes in epigenetic landscape of crucial, important circadian rhythm genes or also known as clock genes. Well, these genes are actually important. They regulate the way our body works, our metabolism. For instance, during the day, it is necessary to produce more insulin because normally we feed ourselves, we eat during the day, not during the night. And if you uh, weren't asleep, weren't asleep during this time, something, make, something changes in the epigenetic regulation. And scientists conducted the study on 15 healthy men, and also glucose tolerance test was impaired after just one 
sleepless night. It, of course, it's not super significant. You see 9%, 4%, by several percent, right? But if it continues to be like this, what it may cause? So what is the mechanism? So for instance, these are transcription factors. They can activate and deactivate particular clock, clock genes. They were methylated. What it makes, uh, what it gives us? Well. You see the arrow is smaller. It means that they are expressed in lesser amount, in lesser strength, so to say, if you will. Uh, and we get less of these important clock genes. They cannot 100% fulfill their role in metabolism regulation, like with insulin production. And eventually, it may cause some diseases to occur, like um, Insufficient, uh, in, in inefficient, um, insufficient insulin production or resistance uh, to yeah, uh, dis desensibilization of the cells that have to um, read insulin, right? Insulin triggers these cells to absorb sugar. And sometimes these receptors cannot be expressed in full amount, and so there's not enough uh, insulin for them to work properly, even if it's a healthy amount. So let's take, an, again, the same picture review it, uh, pancreatic cell, and just let's give the actual names to all these X something. So X1 is the oncogene and has to be silenced all the time. Oncogenes are called like this because they are associated with different cancer conditions, but actually they are very important in embryonic stage when cells have to rapidly divide really fast and in vast uh, quantities. So it, it has to be there at some point, but afterwards it has to be methylated. This is cancer suppressor gene. It has to be always expressed. Well, at some point, it may not work in full capacity as during embryonic development, but then later it has to be expressed all the time. To keep cell differentiated, it already became specialized. It became for instance, beta cell of pancreas. And so it shouldn't divide where it shouldn't divide, okay? We don't want any tumors in pancreas, right? And uh, this can be BDNF or brain, um, yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> brain derived uh, uh, neurotropic factor, neurotrophic factor, which means, uh, which means what feeds brain, what feeds neurons, right? Uh, it, it's needed in neurons, but there is no need. It can mess up things in pancreas. This is gene of insulin, which is really necessary, and pancreas is the only place where it can be produced. So, but again, it's present all over the body. In, in your saliva, the gene for insulin is present, but unfortunately your saliva cannot give you any insulin, right? And same here, and can be any specific gene, one, like my myelin. Myelin is a uh, special fat-like compound that wraps around um, these long exons, long um, uh, yeah, parts of the neuron that connect them with each other. So it's necessary there, but no need here. And well, unfortunately, there is no time to give you much more uh, examples uh, from scientific papers that were published, but it it's actually true. Epigenome can change during the life. It can be shaped by the way we live and our lifestyle. For instance, physical activity. Um, it was proven that physical activity can positively influence our epigenome. Uh, some alcoholic drinks, drinks, they certainly can do something, but it's not clear yet. And currently scientists, <laughs> <laughs> currently scientists are working on it. Uh, some Not people tonight. may have questioned in their mind, what about smoking? I, unfortunately, I cannot give you the answer because smoking has nothing to do with, <laughs> it's, it's not like, don't smoke. <laughs> but uh, sm smoking has nothing to do with the genes that uh, are associated with lung cancer. <laughs> so far, it was not proven. Uh, sleep is important for everybody, okay? So <laughs> get enough sleep <laughs> and keep in mind that your nutrition is amazingly essential for your life. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm eager to answer to that. So if you have any questions. I have a question. In the beginning, you basically posed the question of how the cell knows how to become 
pancreatic cell, a skin cell, mm -hmm. whatever cell. And you explain that biochemistry, so acetylation, acetylation, and so on, how the genes are suppressed or expressed. But to me, this is a little bit like moving the problem. So how does the cell know which genes to express, which to suppress? Honestly, this is so complex that it will take some time. But I mean, shortly, shortly speaking, when we get embryo, yeah, there's, there is only one cell. It is totipotent, which means that it can give rise to any cell of our body. So the genome of, its, of this particular cell is crisp. It's free of any modification. Then it starts to divide. Then you have uh, different stages. Let's go back. It's uh, uh, really, uh, yeah, maybe illustr illustrative. Um, ah, come on. Uh, where is it? Yeah, here it is. So you see? And these cells are actually located at different positions, um, differently oriented, um, um, yes, mm, in accordance to each other, right? And so the upper cell gives rise, uh, the upper layer of this uh, blastocyst gives rise to um, neuronal tube, like organs that will then uh, be responsible for um, sensors, you know, like uh, sensing the environment inner part will give rise to lungs and um, digestive tract and so on. So it's, it's about localization. These cells actually produce secrete uh, parahormones, parahormonic compounds that um, trigger particular pathways in each of them. Depending on their position and many other things that even many biologists don't understand. <laughs> so uh, hopefully that was enough. We can go deeper into it uh, during the break. So I we saw we some hand over there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there much known about the inheritance of these uh, genetic factors? Yes. Uh, well, it is so so-called holy grail of epigenetics, transgenerational epigenetics. And so far there are several studies. Uh, most of them were concentrated of on this embryological period. For instance, there is um, a study that were conducted um, on agouti mice. Agouti mice, they are like, they're yellow. They have gene that uh, changes melanin from being brown to yellow, but it actually triggers different uh, pathways in their body and they become obese and less healthy and they can live shorter lives. But if you feed these uh, mother mice before pregnancy and during pregnancy, with sources sources of uh, methyl group like vitamin B12, um, folic acid, betaine, and some others, they have they give rise, they give birth to a uh, healthy offspring. But this is during pregnancy. The other study were conducted um, on people. This is the only one that so far exists that actually points us to idea that actually it is possible to have transgenerational epigenetics in humans uh, on long-term run. So there was a um, huge famine, hunger, Dutch hunger of 1944-1945. During the war they, they were blockaded and there was a village where people uh, didn't have access to food but they had really nice hospital where uh, doctors, physicians recorded how much calories they got during certain periods, like during all this hunger, they, these people were observed uh, and the offsprings of those people who were exposed to hunger, they um, had some um, higher chances of getting diabetes, metabolic disorders, uh, shorter lifespan after six decades. But again, it's really hard to conduct such study on humans and uh, get reliable results. So far it's, it's unique of some sort to study. You can take a look uh, in the internet. It's in open um, open access. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, it's, it's really interesting, but it's it's complex. Okay. That's cool. So we have time for one question more. Yeah. Yes. See differences in the epigenome between identical Of course. <laughs> I actually wanted to put this example <laughs> with identical twins, and uh, many epigenetic studies are actually performed uh, with epigenetic twins. So uh, many reviews, they take, for instance, 70 epigenetic twins, uh, identical twins, sorry, 
uh, and uh, then scan read sequence their uh, genome, epigenome, with special techniques. Nowadays, it gives us high throughput, and so it's possible to get results relatively fast. And yeah, depending on the way, uh, like where they live, the environmental factors, uh, maybe climate where they live, and many other things, some genes may be more methylated, some, some others uh, may be less methylated. Same with histone modifications. Uh, so I can give you one example about people who do power squats. So <laughs> in those people, their uh, muscle cells were diagnosed, and it turns out that genes that are responsible for myosin and actin production, and uh, well, genes that are responsible for productivity and efficiency of muscles are more acetylated. So histones that are um, playing role in packaging these genes. And so these genes can be more actively expressed, more actively used by muscle cells. And yeah, so you should be, sh should keep yourself fit. <laughs> That's <laughs> it's my a, It's a nice conclusion, actually. So uh, thank you.